<laughs> the scriptures of God's word today is Joshua uh, 24, 14 to 28. Now the fear of the Lord served him with all faithfulness, who always the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt, and served the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us up out of, <coughs> our fathers up out of Egypt, from that land of slavery, and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey, and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Ammonites, who lived in the land. We who will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve other foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make, it, <clears throat> make an end to you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are the witness against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses. They replied, <clears throat> replied Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you, and yield your hearts to the Lord God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at you. he drew up from them decrees, decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took... <coughs> a large stone, and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words of the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untru untru untrue to your God. Then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. So be it. Those longer passages puts fear into his heart. <laughs> but thank goodness we have Jesus to take it away. Children, church, if you're going, Kira's saying, come on. <laughs> and we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for um, the gift that we have through the Spirit. As Joshua said, we cannot serve the Lord. So you gave us your Spirit. We can't achieve salvation or holiness, so you gave us Jesus Christ. We're here, Father, today to learn and to praise you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, but not to forget also that you are a just and holy God, and that is something we want also so that we know the hope that we have that heaven will be a perfect place for all eternity and that your power reigns supreme. Lord, as we study your word today, just open up your spirit to us. Help us to take in those words and apply them to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you listen to some of those words, you saw a lot of stuff there. You said He even said that the rock was a witness against them. So if you hear the rock start crying out, <laughs> that should tell you something, that you're not crying out and professing the name of Christ. And that we do have an advocate, that we have the Spirit inside of us, that we don't have to 
go to the temple to an earthly high priest anymore. We are a body, a group of living priests to present the word to Jesus Christ. So many parallelisms here, and that's what the message that I entitled was the Son of Man lifted up for me, for you, individually. Christ died for each and every one of us, but to unite us together as a holy people, the church. See, the parallelism was Israel and everything. So I want to start with asking you some questions. Oh, you hate when a pastor does this, don't you? Even raise your hands if you want to. Oh, now I'm getting out of line, aren't I? Because <laughs> we don't want to do that. First question, okay? And you raise your hands for other things. Uh, who wants the 49ers to win over the Patriots? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Raise your hands up, right? Okay. See what I'm getting at? But we don't want to raise our hands about these serious things. Okay, and I don't care if you raise your hand or not. First question, do you believe God is who He claims He is in the Bible? All the claims about Him. Because see, if you don't believe that, then you're not going to ever go and worship Him. Even, even if you think you believe and you think you have the Spirit of God inside of you, which you might be fooling yourself, if you don't believe God is totally sovereign in control, chances are you're never going to come to, to salvation through Christ. Second of all, if you do, you're not going to live a worthy life because you don't understand that God Almighty created you. He is who commands angel armies, who's beyond space and time and everything else. And hopefully you can see this if you're reading along. All those rules, all those rituals, all those things they had to do to cleanse themselves. And a lot of them were just normal things even. But yet you still had to cleanse yourself. A, a woman had to wait because she had a child. That's a blessing from God. But she was unpure and couldn't come around. That's God's standard, whether you understand it or not. And Jesus Christ came to make us holy, blameless, once and for all so that we could come to God directly without Aaron and his sons and the Levites and everything. Do you see the importance here? God did all of that for us because He wants a relationship with you, each and every one of you, for all of eternity. Wow. He is in complete control. There's nothing that can come along that He will not take care of if you put your faith and trust in Him. Okay? Second question. Do you believe God loves you? Not the world, but you. That He died for you. Satan wants to tell you a lie. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to tell you that you're not good enough. Or maybe you've sinned too much. Or God just doesn't care about me. Or whatever those thoughts that He plants in your mind. They're all lies from the devil. God loves each and every one of you. Amen. So much that He would send His only Son to die for you. So much that He would send His Spirit to live inside of you so that you would not be like the Israelite encampments. You can live a holy, blameless life. In fact, Jesus said, Be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. We just have to die so that the Spirit can live through us. Third question. Do you have saving belief in Jesus? Now notice I've said believe three times or belief. Because see, we're not talking about I believe that it's going to snow today or it's going to be sunny today. I believe looking outside it's going to be sunny today. But the weather changes, doesn't it? I believe that I'm healthy right now. There's not cancer in my body, but I may go and find out later today that I have a deadly cancer. There's nothing I can do about it. I believe these things, but that's not believe that the Bible's talking about, and that's where you've got to go back and study the words and read everything to see what it talks about. When you're seeing all these rules of a holy, righteous God and what He demands from His people, I think believing in Jesus Christ means more than, yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He died on the cross but that He is God that died for you so that you could live for Him and then inherit eternal life. That you believe that without a shadow of a doubt that you put your total faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Just like we'll see when we, we examine the serpent and everything. They had to fix their eyes on that serpent. 
Well, why would I do that? That's crazy, stupid, a, si a weird sign like he said. Why would I do that? Because God told me to. He said to choose life or death. You decide which one you want to choose. So even though it may seem foolish to you, you've got to lift your eyes up and look at that snake if you want to live. And that's a direct representation of Jesus Christ, that unless you fix your eyes on Him for your salvation, for your life to live this life so that you can face all those fears and turmoils and troubles that come along, unless you put your total faith and trust in Him, you will not live for all eternity. So that's what I mean by that saving belief. Fourth question is, what are you told from Scripture that a believer in Jesus is? Sometimes it's easier to, to know what a, a believer is not, and that's like I said, that it's going to be sunny today. I don't know that. I don't even know for sure that there'll be oxygen when I wake up in the morning. Something could easily happen that changes those parameters. We get used to that, and we're under God's guiding hand of comfort, but there are places in the world where they don't have drinking water, they don't have this or that. There could be a day that we don't have oxygen to breathe. Will you put your faith in Jesus Christ? That's what believing means. Total trust, total confidence that God loves you so much that He would send His Son, and if you believe in Him, you will have eternal life. Genesis 15, 6 reads this way, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. goes on to say later in Genesis 22, verse 1 and 2, sometimes later God tested Abraham. The NLT says tested Abraham's faith. It puts that in there so you can understand that a little bit better. What, what was he testing? He was testing whether Abraham truly, we can put this word in here, believed. Right? That's faith and belief can be put together. They've got to be put together. <laughs> he said to him, God said to Abraham, Here I am, he replied. Abraham replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son. See the parallelism here? Whom you love, and for God so loved the world, he, you know He loved His Son. If you have a child, you understand that. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. By name, it is Isaac. Not Ishmael, not anything else. We're naming out the child. This promise of God, wait a minute. If I take this son's life, how can God give me the promise that He had, the covenant that He made that, that I'll be a great nation when I don't have any offspring to do that from? But take your son and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Burnt offerings don't come back. <laughs> They're sacrificed to God. They're dead and gone. But Noah believed that God would do something. He was obedient to God because he feared God out of holy reverence. He believed that he should do whatever God commanded, period, whether it made sense or not. Did you read your homework? Hebrews, I said, read Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19, we see more tying this story together. By faith who? Abraham. When God tested him, tested his faith, offered Isaac. We know the rest of the story. He went. He went, raised up the knife, and then saw a ram in the thicket that he could offer instead of his child. But read, read on what it says here. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac um, that your offspring will be reckoned, verse 19, Abraham reasoned, not with worldly wisdom, but with wisdom that comes from fearing God. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. He didn't think he was going to provide a ram. Scripture says here he believed he'd bring Isaac back to life. Nothing like that had been seen or heard but a direct representation of Jesus Christ again. Will you sacrifice your son for me? Guess what? I'm going to sacrifice my son for you. And that's how you're going to be saved. Whether it's foolishness to the world, that's why Paul writes in Corinthians that this message of the cross is foolishness to the world. But it's the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. So a believer believes that God is holy, believes that God is supreme, sovereign, everything else, 
believes that they have to come to God the way He tells them to because we can't come to God on our own. If He provides a way, a truth, and a life, the way, the truth, and the life, then Jesus Christ is that way, that truth, and that life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. They believe that their life is not their own because it was ransomed back, purchased from an eternity in hell to an eternity of eternal life in heaven with God the Father. Not just God, not a strange foreign God, but God as my Father. A Christian believes that God is holy and demands His people, which now we can put instead of the nation of Israel there, we can put the church. Those called out to proclaim the gospel message to be the hands and feet of Christ. He demands holiness from His people. And we are sanctified not by the blood of animals, but the blood, by the blood of His one and only Son, who laid down His life even as we were enemies. If you can come see Ben-Hur, you'll see the crucifixion scene in there. You'll see how that, that affects, affects you to Ben-Hur. And then you'll see what Peter wrote about it, that love covers a multitude of sins because there is such betrayal, such damage in the heart of him and his family from what happened there. There is no hope, but yet he sees this one man who says, I'm laying down my life willingly, and it changes everything. And they look upon each other with love instead of hatred. So a Christian also believes... Even more than if a holy nation of Israel had to be righteous before God and do all these things, that Jesus Christ didn't die so you could just sit there and be saved. It doesn't work that way, guys. If you believe in Jesus Christ, your light will shine, right, Polly? You will see that people will see your good works and glorify your Father that's in heaven. So I have one more question. Are you a believer then? And does your life show it? Jesus says clearly you'll know them by their fruits. He says my sheep will listen to my voice. He said if you love me, you will love your brothers and sisters. You'll love even your enemy. Think about these questions as we look at this scripture. If you did your homework assignment... <laughs> Then you read through Hebrews chapter 11, which we read a couple verses earlier. I want to read a little further down. Hebrews 11 verse 32, and I'm going to read into chapter 12 verse 3. And what more shall we say? Because <laughs> he's talked about all these Old Testament things and what Jesus Christ has done for us as our ultimate high priest, as the ultimate sacrifice. He says, what do I say? I do not have time to tell you. He's already told us about Abraham and Noah and all these. I don't have time to tell you about Gideon. Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Hey, we get to read about them soon if you keep reading. Okay, Verse 33, Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the, flame, the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, re refused to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection, that hope that we have through Jesus. Some faced jeers and floggings even, and even chains and imprisonments. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, not a bronze snake on a, on a pole, but Jesus Christ on a wooden cross, who bled out His blood to save us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Well, I forget, skipped, didn't I? 
Did I? Okay, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And there's so many other scriptures you should think about there as you're reading. The fact that Jesus says that anybody who wants to be his disciple, who wants to follow after, after him, if he puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not worthy of the kingdom. There's so many other verses that you can think of. But right now I want to focus on where we're at in our reading so that we can see how everything in the Old Testament tells of Jesus Christ. God knew everything that He was doing. He knew all the plagues that He would send. He knew Pharaoh. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. But that's because Pharaoh hardened his heart first to God. We still have a choice. We can get into those topics later if you want to come ask me about them. We'll sit down and talk about them. But everybody has a choice. Judas had a choice. Just because God knows that Judas wouldn't turn doesn't mean he couldn't turn. Big difference. But he knows and he uses our lives, whether we're for him or against him, to bring him glory and honor. Oh, let him use your life with him to bring glory and honor. Because he's going to bring it either way. He used Pharaoh. He used Judas. And don't think that you're immune. Because the Israelites didn't have to go through the first plagues, but they definitely had to go through the last plagues, didn't they? They definitely had to sacrifice that lamb and then repeat that process year after year after year teaching their children because that blood that they posted over the doorpost is what kept them from having the angel of death take their firstborn away so that God could give His firstborn back to you. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus was the firstborn. It means importance if you look up that word and study it again. The firstborn was the important one of the family clan because he would go on to inherit twice of everything. So if you're reading, you realize Judah was not the firstborn. But Judah sinned and lost his father's blessing. So did the next son. So did the next son. So then we've got Judah, where the lion of Judah, our Savior, Christ, Jesus, comes from. Maybe some of these things are coming together now. So if you read or if you're going to be reading, you're not there yet, you'll read about the venomous snake that was talked about in the thing. And we talked about that some in Bible study. And I asked the guys, I said, how many people do you think that the venomous snakes bit that day? Well, let me read you scripture. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 19. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. You got that but there. They're going to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, but instead they grumbled. Hmm. Verse 5, They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. We know that's not true. We've already read the bread and it tasted like honey wafers from heaven, right? And they said, Woo, thank you, Lord. And then they didn't have to do anything except go collect it. And they could collect all they wanted to collect. Just don't collect more because we want to rely on God to give us our daily bread. Get that? Okay? Because it's going to spoil otherwise. But you can take all you want today and eat it. You'll be satisfied. <clears throat> they spoke against God and Moses and said, Why have you brought us out from Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. Well, we know that. It's not true. We saw that in the video too because how Moses tried to put himself up on the pedestal of God. And we detest this miserable food. It was honey before. Okay. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. What did God do? Because of their grumbling? Grumbling is sin against God, the one who gives you the breath of life, the one who created you for His purpose. And yet you grumbled against Him, so He brought punishment. That punishment was death. Okay? But before it was death, hopefully none of you have ever had a snake bite. I haven't, but I've seen pictures, I've read and stuff. It's painful. It hurts. The, the poison courses through your body. Your area that you get bit inflames to the point where the, the skin around it dies. The death comes to the flesh first before it comes to the body. Because they grumbled against God, death was coming. But God who is just is also merciful. <laughs> Praise be to God. And He offers a way of escape. Okay? 
The Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. Now, it doesn't say how many people, okay? The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Still doesn't say how many people. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on the pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, what happened? They lived. So when we were watching the video earlier, Mo Merle poked me on the back. He said, all of them got bit. Because <laughs> that's what we were talking about the other night. I said, how many of them got bit, Bible scholars? Oh, I got this number and this number. Every one of them was different. And they thought that maybe they read it somewhere. Maybe they saw it in a movie. <laughs> Maybe some preacher ta taught it to them that wasn't teaching the Word of God. I don't know. Maybe it's tradition. doesn't say how many people got bit. But this is a representation of life or death, choosing Jesus Christ or choosing death. I think all of I think, and Merle thinks, you don't have to, that all of them were bitten. And if you look back on judgment, if you look back on the plagues and stuff again, all of Israelite faced the plagues. Not the ones that were righteous or not. All of them had to put the blood on the doorpost. Every last one of them. Do you think who didn't put it on there because of their righteousness, the angel of death passed over them? No. So I think everyone was bitten that day. That's my opinion. Don't take it out of context. Don't go say, Alan said this. Okay. That's what I think based off of my belief because of what it's a representation of. Okay, what do they grumble about? Stuff God already provided, <laughs> right? They mocked the God who gave them life and supplied all their needs. How many times do we grumble and complain? Because we don't have things going our way. Because we don't have a vending machine, God, that we can put our prayers in, put our faith in, and punch the Coke button or the Diet Coke button or the Zero button or the Coke with flavor Whatever it is. Oh, oh, I don't want cherry. I want lime. And the world teaches us that. And instant gratification, because if you put it in and it takes a minute, you're like, I've hit the button. What's going on? Oh, there it comes. We get impatient. When God created us, He loved us enough to create us. He loved us enough to pursue us all through history. And then He loved us enough to send His Son to die for us. What is the hope that we have as the children of the Most High? So how can we live like that? In Exodus chapter 16, starting in verse 2, we read this. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Looks like we've got a pattern that's still going on here in Numbers, don't it? And you should have read that. The Israelites said to them, If we only had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt... There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And this way I will test them, like we saw with Abraham earlier, right? And see whether they will what? Follow my instructions. That was before you read Levit Leviticus. Where you're reading in Leviticus, all these regulations over and over again. And that's why I wanted to say, hey, hold on. And, you, and numbers might get better here soon. But now you're reading the numbers. That's what it is. It's the numbers of the clans out in the desert. Okay? Verse 8, Moses also said, you will know that, know that I... Wait a minute. Moses also said, You will know that I was the Lord when He gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning. All that you want. And they got meat and bread because He has heard your grumbling against Him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against me, but against the Lord. Dropping down to verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is this? For they did not know what it was. Something totally new. This way of salvation that, Jesus is gonna, that God's going to offer through Jesus. The people of Israel called the bread manna. 
It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. And all this grumbling and complaining just walked through all the plagues, saw the angel of death pass above them, saw the waters parted and the, and the armies of Pharaoh destroyed. And that's why we watched the, the movie about Exodus Friday. And they're grumbling and complaining. And we want to say, how could they do that? But yet we grumble and complain when there's too much snow, too little snow, too cold, too hot. Right? What's in the... All right, here you go, Merle. <laughs> What's in the Ark of the Covenant? Name me one thing that's in there that we just talked about. One thing in the Ark? Yep. Thank you, Barb. Manna, she stole it out from under you. This bread from heaven is even in the Ark of the Covenant, so they would remember it. You'll, you'll get to that, which you might have got to it. I don't remember. Where was it at? We've already got to it? I can't remember. Anyway. <laughs> Just testing you, sorry. <laughs> they had all they could eat, something new they had never even seen before. They'd seen all the miracles, and they wanted more. The passage doesn't say for sure, but it implies that we're all guilty. Oh, I think that's a verse in Romans, isn't it? For all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. And another verse in Romans, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. 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 The joy that we have that we should proclaim because of Jesus in our lives. If you're with us in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians we've gone through chapter 10 already. You might remember these words that Paul penned to the Corinthian church. Because here was a body of believers called out to the world who was letting the world infect them. Who was divided instead of united who instead of realizing that spiritual gifts were given to build up the body of Christ, they were seeing who had the better spiritual gift. And we'll be talking even more about that tonight because we're in chapter 14 and that's a chapter that so many people use to say that there's an angelic tongue, there's a prayer tongue, there's this and that. Maybe there is, maybe there ain't. Come tonight. <laughs> but the point Paul was making is you're doing it all wrong. You don't have the love of Christ in your heart. You're not using any gifts of the Spirit to build up one another. Instead, you're tearing them down. If only you understood the message of the cross. But it seems to be foolishness to you. So in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 10, we've read these words. For I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were under the cloud and that they'd all passed through the sea. And see, this is, was what was taught to the Israelites for many, many years, of which they... Their children were taught to memorize the first five books of the Bible. It's all you can do to get through and reading them, right? So that they would not forget who the Lord their God was. <clears throat> so I'll start over. For I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. Hmm. And they drank the same spiritual water. For they drank for the same spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Hmm. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Probably talking about the golden calf. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. Hmm. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. God will bring His judgment, and God is not a God to be mocked. Instead, He is a jealous God. Just if I'm jealous that if someone comes up to my wife and starts hitting on her, I have that right. She is my wife. And I would be jealous in that way. Now, jealousy in other ways, wrong, we know that. But jealousy in the way of God wanting His children to love Him and love only Him is something that He expects and demands. <clears throat> so what point am I trying to make? I said it before. Jesus. 
<laughs> Jesus, Jesus, the one who ended all of the law. Not that he put the law aside, but that he completed it because all of the law was pointing to God's mercy and grace through him. Now see, the danger today without reading the Old Testament and understanding that is you're going to get someone who does not know and say, well, how could the Old Testament God be the same as the New Testament God? That's just not possible. That's crazy. But then when you see what God was doing and how He was making a different people that was set apart from the pagan world that God had given chances for them to come and some of them did come into uh, the Israelite faith and were saved. But those that didn't come in, God told, him to told them to destroy them because He didn't want their gods affecting them. So you can understand in a little bit more the, the holiness of God and what Jesus Christ has done for you. And you don't have to do all these things. And so then when I preach later on giving, not tithing, but giving, because you don't have to tithe anymore, then you'll sit there and say, wait a minute, tithing's not 10%. They had to give this, 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 this. Rose said the other day, I'll pick on Rose now, she said, you know, I sin a lot. I wouldn't have any flock left. <laughs> and I was like, me too, sister. <laughs> I would have no things except that God supplied them in the first place. So how much can I give now because of Jesus Christ? Uh, instead of how much do I have to give, that's what you hear, how much can you afford not to give? That's why Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brothers and sisters, brethren, the church, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Give it all. Which is just saying what Jesus has already told us, to love the Lord your God with all, and then to love your neighbor with all. Because if you love your neighbor, 10th commandment, you won't covet, so then you won't steal, kill, so forth. And then you'll put God on the throne where He belongs. If you start on the front of the, the 10 commandments, if you put God on your throne, you won't ever kill, steal, or covet. It's just the way it works. And Jesus summed those up in the two commandments. Put God first. Know who He is and what He's done for you through Jesus Christ. And you will be a believer. And you will be a follower. Jesus will be your Savior and He will be your Lord. In John chapter 3, we discussed this a little bit in the Bible study of the night, so you can get a peak preview of what the sermon might be like in Bible study sometimes. What's John 3, 16? We all know it. What's John 3, 14 and 15? I got deer and headlight looks again when I said it. Let's read. Starting in verse 1 of John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, one who knew all of the law, all the requirements of it. His, his name was Nicodemus. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. He didn't want to come in the day. He might be exposed. Okay, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. We know that. But we don't want to proclaim you as Savior and Lord. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter into their second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit, that's what you've got to be born of, gives life to spirit. What you're going to have only left when this body is decaying and gone. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now let me just throw this in here right quick so you know that I'm not saying this. We will get new bodies too, but that's a different sermon. Okay? The body you have now will decay and rot. Okay? Verse 14. The two prior, 14 and 15, come prior to 16, right? You got that math down. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. Oh my goodness. So the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. That's why the snake was raised up in the wilderness. That's why judgment came so that they could see life, eternal life, not just physical, through Jesus Christ that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. No other way. 
Verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. I think 14 and 15 are pertinent to knowing 16, don't you? And if you know 16, you know 17, 18, 19, 20 pretty pertinent to that too. And in your Bibles, 14 and 15 are all read in every edition you got. But 16 may be read in your Bible, may not be read. That may not be Jesus' word. We don't know. We weren't there. They didn't tell us when we start, started coming down and putting them into the translations that you have now and everything, which ones were Jesus. Some of them are obvious. That one's not obvious because it goes to a prepositional phrase and starts kind of talking in the third person. Maybe that's Jesus' words, maybe it aren't. Doesn't matter what you believe. Fine. Doesn't matter what color your print is in your Bible. But the ones before it were definitely Jesus' words to Nicodemus. Think about that. So even more important, if Jesus stopped his conversation at verse 15... Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the man must be lifted up, verse 14. Why? That everyone who believes may have eternal life in Jesus. You don't need to go on with 16. Oh, don't get me wrong and don't throw stones at me. But Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus may have been over there. The conversation. The next word may be John's pen. They might be Jesus' also. But he said enough. You are the ruler, the religious ruler. You know the law. You know why that snake was lifted up, don't you? I'm the reason. I'm here before you today. Will you come out of the darkness and into the light so that you might have eternal life? The choice is up to you. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. In Acts chapter 2, we have the story of the Pentecost. There's your homework. Because if I read it, we're going to be way over time. See what happened there. See what happened with the birth of the church. See how that chapter concludes with the God added to their numbers daily. To the church. To the body of Christ. To the new holy people. And think about what we need to do so that we will add to our numbers daily those who are being saved. I will start here next week, so since I didn't finish here today, more than likely, who knows. <laughs> so read that and see what you think about that. And ask this question to yourself, and I'm not pointing fingers, I'm asking you to motivate you, to spur you. Is our church growing like that? Should be. There should be mighty miracles being done. God should be adding to our numbers daily through Jesus Christ. It is such a blessing to see some children in here. If we don't answer that question, they will go out of here just as easily as they came in here. As you get older and you die and your children aren't coming, this church will die. Plain and simple. Not that hard to figure that one out. So we need to do everything we can to spur one another and to bring our children in here and love them and not lose any of them. Because the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, chew up, and consume that they may not have eternal life in Christ. Instead, Hebrews tells us, and this is a verse I'm going to close with, verse is, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured His cross, the cross, and we're called to endure ours, scorning its shame. And then He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him, consider Jesus, who endured such oppositions from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, as you keep on reading, you'll see that not everyone of Israel was of Israel. And not everyone that says they're a Christian is of Christ. That's why James was the first letter written in the New Testament. Did you know that? We'll talk about that. Because he told a group of believers, Christians, they weren't called that yet, just because of timing, he told him, he said, I don't believe you. 
because you're not living the way your mouth's professing. I believe you're more like what Isaiah talked about, which Jesus quoted. A people, a people, the church, who profess me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. Let us not be that church. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for your mercy, your goodness, for your justice as well. And I so thank you for Jesus Christ. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. May we be a body that is called out to bring glory and honor to you, drawing others to the cross, to salvation through Jesus Christ. May we spur one another. May we read your word as the, as the church together, as we see in Acts 2, and pray and fellowship and study so that we can be a united body instead of a divided body. A body that God adds to our numbers daily, those that are being saved. We thank you and praise you for all that you do. Glory and honor to God the Father and to Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was slain for our sins. In His precious name we pray. Amen. I don't know where our song...